For $1,000, uh, you can have a dried in structure. It allows you to build something um, and get it done and get out of your rent, your mortgage. It allows you to have shelter, maybe a, a place to just vacation uh, or a home. But either way, even if it's not the perfect thing, you get to sell it later for a profit. And it's something that by myself, I can put up in seven days. It really doesn't take that long. It takes longer to do all your preparation work on the ground than it does to actually uh, get the building up. Because anywhere you can get the bag of cement and a bucket of water, you can build one of these. Hi, my name is Tom Appel, author of Living Homes, Stonemasonry Log, and Straw Bale Construction. And I've been super excited about the immense potential of aircrete as a insulating building material. So I jumped at the opportunity to uh, get some first-hand exposure to aircrete with Daniel Allen at the Tiny Giant Life School in Terlingua, Texas, just outside of Big Bend National Park. So we make our slurry first by adding our Portland to the water. For production purposes, Daniel normally mixes aircrete in a 55-gallon drum. But for today's demonstration, all we needed was a five-gallon bucket. One really unique aspect to Daniel's approach is that he does not use any sand in his aircrete formula, which reduces the strength of the aircrete somewhat, but greatly maximizes or optimizes the R value or insulation value of the aircrete. He basically pours an entire building out of insulation, then comes back afterwards and applies surface bonding to the inside and outside to bring the building up to full strength. So, like I said, we normally inject it from the bottom, but being a small bucket, we'll just shoot it in the top. Okay. This is where the magic happens. Injecting the foam quickly expands the cement slurry to six times its original volume. This can be done with dish soap or a product called Drexel, but Daniel's favorite foaming agent is called Vermilion, which is made specifically for producing aircrete. And we'll reverse the drill because it actually does a better job mixing running backwards. Okay. So we'll go backwards and then we'll spiral and as we spiral around we'll lift up and the idea being to try to turn the whole batch over from top to bottom mm -hmm. to be consistent from top to bottom and not have like a spot full of bones. Okay. That's really all it takes and see when you come out you see it leaves traces still. Mm -hmm. And see how when I flick that in there, it leaves a truck. You can see it leaves an impact crater. So typically we use the buckets because it's low tech, it's off the shelf. And again, we're not adding prices. You can buy a machine that'll mix it and pump it up in a hose for, you know, like $37,000. <laughs> but how many of these little houses could you build for that same money? Mm -hmm. Typically uh, a whole batch is six cubic feet. Um, and so we, that's a, a 94 pound bag of cement. So normally we add five and a half gallons of water in here and we, then we take that entire sack of cement and we just rest it up here. And once you get it, all you have to do is just stand here and maybe rock a little bit side to side and you get the whole barrel mix. And when you're building a house, especially by yourself, it's like the zen of building, right? You maximize, you, you perfect those motions and you minimize the effort that you're putting into it because at the end of a day or a week or a month, it really adds up. Once the cement's all in, we turn on the foam machine, which injects the foam through a line at the bottom. And as the foam's trying to rise, you're mixing it in. And you just mix it until the barrel reaches our little uh, depth detector here. Um, and that's our six cubic foot batch. So you've essentially taken one cubic foot of cement, inflated it six times with air. And um, after we're done mixing, we, we do these little double checks like checking to see if you have a pancake type batter. If I flick some cement on top of it, does it leave a crater? If it doesn't, then we may have messed up and it's too liquidy. If it's too liquidy, the bubbles float out and it deflates. So then typically we'll pull our little rebar pin here that keeps the barrel. And then we'll pour it into our bucket. And because of the where the casters are bolted, it won't tilt itself over. It'll, it'll stop before it just dumps itself. Uh, when you have weight. So then we'll we'll go over to our formwork and we'll pour it in the walls 
And our form work, you can probably see the lines here. This is a typical pour. This is where the forms are sitting on this hole. It'll be about this far. And whenever you pour one full batch in here, it'll be maybe, maybe three inches high, filling the entire form for a 144 square foot room at, at this thickness. Then it sits for 22 to 24 hours. Uh, and at which time you come out the next morning and we remove these clamps. We have to pull them all out and then we take the formwork down. We clean it up a little bit. If necessary, we'll oil it. We'll put the pipes back in and then we're using the pipes as the holder, we will set them back on the wall and then clamp everything together. Your formula doesn't have any sand in it. So uh, what, is, what is the benefit of going without the sand? So the reason that we typically do air creed is because it's not only structural, uh, but it's insulating and it's the air itself that creates the insulation. So those millions of little air bubbles actually stop the heat from transferring through the wall. If you add sand though, you start gluing pieces of sand together, it creates a path for heat to move through and you lose your insulation value. So the cracks, this is one of the things that turn most people off of aircrete. Um, and these cracks don't go all the way through, but all concrete cracks, the, the, the concrete your house is on has thousands or hundreds of little cracks. It probably has a few big cracks. The bridges you drive across have cracks. I know that this uh, looks very concerning to people, but as we saw with the engineering, that when you've done the math and you know that you've only got less than two pounds of pressure at the very bottom of this wall and it's brand new, um, you know that you have a massive safety margin by the time it cures to 160 or 170 pounds per square inch. And because it's all bonded up and we have a bond beam on the wall, it's all held together. There's that hash pattern in here. That's the uh, fiberglass mesh that's been bonded to the wall. And then here's where, of course, there's no, no mesh. And here you can kind of see the mesh sticking through a little bit. So you lay down a nice thick coat of this uh, bonding agent, which is like a glue essentially. And then you lay the fabric into it and then you trowel it through. And once you, your, your goal is to bury the fabric and embed it uh, within this finish coat, which is essentially glued across the entire surface. So with the fiberglass 70 PSI for every inch, that's 70 pounds of tensile strength times every foot, you know, now you're, you're already getting up into hundreds of pounds of strength over the entire wall. So you're dispersing all of these loads and all these stresses. And once it's cured, which takes about 30 days, you're up to about 160, 170 pounds uh, per square inch of force, which if you take uh, two by fours and put them on 24 inch centers, uh, the failure weight of that's about 1400 pounds for two two by fours. Whereas it'd be 1900 pounds for this air creek at three and a half inches thick. And because we cast these structures, they're essentially a, almost like a monolithic pour. They're essentially one solid piece, one solid mm -hmm. structure. Because, you know, if you cut, if you make blocks, you have to cut blocks, you have to move blocks, you have to mortar blocks, you have to stack blocks. And so it's, it's more labor and more time. And so I prefer a faster, easier building method. And air creek's so light, a five gallon bucket of it weighs very little. And so it's just, to me, especially as I get older, it's, it's very nice to, to not have to struggle and fight with it. You just carry it over in a bucket and get as fancy as you want to on the delivery, but you know, a drill, a barrel and a bucket and air compressor and you're in business. And you can actually intentionally design these to be added onto one after another. I mean, here we have a whole bunch of small structures, but collectively, I think we have about 1600 square feet. So we essentially have a normal house at this point. It's just kind of spread out and the hallway is outdoors. <laughs> One of the things I really like about the Tiny Giant Life School is that in addition to the in-depth classes where you build an entire structure from foundation to roof, uh, you can also schedule your own custom class. And that could be a half a day or a full day or several days where you come, you stay in an aircrete room, and you can select from up to 40 different topics uh, covering all aspects of off-grid living, from uh, air creek construction to solar electric generation. Now here we've got, you know, 15 solar panels on this row, and it's forming a solar porch, which the solar porch um, basically is shielding the front or south side of the house so that the summer sun, basically except this time of day, never shines on the house. So that keeps it even cooler than it was. So we kind of have a double purpose with the solar panels. And because we have so many solar panels, 
even on a cloudy day, usually by 11 or 11.30 in the morning, are, we're fully charged. And, um, you know, you can spend a lot for solar. And I have to mention, like you go to Sun Elect, you can buy these wholesale uh, at f as low as 42 cents a watt. Or if you get some used ones, sometimes they have them for 12 cents a watt. That's amazing. And so you get them wholesale, you put them up, uh, rather than use specialized hardware that costs a lot of money. We just use standard C channel that's used in construction. We lined up the bolting. And so, you know, it's it's something that can take a little patience, but once you get it down, anybody can put this together and you become your own power company, you become your own housing company, you become your own utilities. So when I think of a, a tiny house, I usually think like um, thirty to fifty thousand dollars for something barely big enough to turn around in. Yeah. Um, but this is really something that you can uh, escape having the mortgage. Yeah. Um, so, you know, where we're at here, there's really no economy per se other than tourism, and so by not having any expense, it allows us to be here because we don't have those expenses. We don't have mortgages. We don't have rent. And it's not like this has to be the, the end all of everything. This could be your lawnmower shed later. Uh, to me, it's about just getting a start. And then often people are surprised, I was surprised, that as you downsize and move into something, you simplify your life, it actually gets better. Um, and you find that you actually don't need or even want, you know, the giant house anymore. Uh, because what you own actually owns you. And, but at least when you build something, it sets you free to save uh, to live an alternative type of, type of life where you, know, you get to choose what you're gonna do with your day as opposed to I have to pay the rent this week.